25 years ago, I was teaching at the Army War College. Now, the War College is the premier school for teaching our senior military officers to become general officers, to think strategically. And this particular uh, time, I was teaching a course called Advanced Technologies for the Military Leader, or as I called it, Computers for Colonels. Now, <clears throat> now, in this particular day, I was teaching a class on cryptology or the science and math behind sending and receiving secret messages. And I explained to the students how if you had a message and you use a special application and you use a, a secret key, you could wrap your message up and then send it to somebody. And if they had the application and they had a special key, they would be able to unwrap it. And no one else would be able to break that key. Nobody else could guess that key. Even using the most powerful computers we had, it would take more than their lifetime to figure out what that key was. When I got done teaching on the beauty of science and mathematics, I turned to our guest speaker. Now, I invited Frank Height to come talk. Frank is probably the world's best hacker. And I asked him to come and speak on what hacking is, why they do it, and why, what is it that they do. And I really wanted to get the, that perspective to the, to the uh, senior military officers, to understand it. So Frank got up, and he looked out into the audience full of people that looked a lot like me with green uniforms and shiny medals and all these little ribbons. And later he would tell me we looked like a bunch of Christmas trees. And he reached back, and he disconnected his ponytail. And he flipped this giant ponytail over his head, and he flipped it back. And he said something that would change my life. Everything Mike said is true, and none of it matters. And he wasn't being negative. He wasn't, he wasn't insulting me. I thought like a mathematician. I thought like an engineer. I didn't think like a hacker. I didn't understand security. So Frank would go on, and he would explain how our government computers are so insecure, anybody could just break in. And then they could turn off my application or delete it and force me to use some other means to send that message it was less secure. Or they could change the key and make it so small that anybody could guess it. Or they could break into the computer and read the message before it was wrapped in that key or at its destination after it was unwrapped. Frank really opened my eyes that day. He was supposed to speak for 30 minutes. He spoke for three hours, and no one got up and left. So you're probably thinking to yourself, that's 25 years ago. Things have probably changed since then. You'd be absolutely true. It's gotten much worse. Because computers are still just as insecure, and they always will be. Except now we're taking our most sensitive information and our most sensitive system, and we've connected it to the internet, which is connected to the whole world, which is a good thing. Except no matter who you are, there's hundreds, thousands, or millions of people who want to cause mischief to you. So if you talk to a politician or a vendor or a consultant, we're going to tell you we need to double down. We need to spend more money. We need to buy more technology. We need to look to the future. But the future is not going to save us. We actually need to look to the past. So we're going to step into my time machine, because I'm an engineer and we build things. And we're going to go back in time 90 years. And the first person we run into is Alan Turing. Alan Turing is a brilliant 24-year-old mathematician. He just got his undergraduate. And he's really interested in what kind of mathematical problems he could solve with a computer. There's just one problem. Nobody's invented a computer. No one even knows what they would look like or how they would work. So the first thing he's got to do is come up with a theory of computation. How would a computer work? And he builds what we would later call a Turing machine, which is a theoretical model for all computers and how they work. And it's still our model we use today. But that's not all. In the same paper, he goes on to show that Everything, any problem a human can solve, a computer can solve. So not only has he, does, has he invented the field of computer science, but he's invented the field of artificial intelligence. 
But that's not all. This 24-year-old mathematician proves that there are certain problems that cannot be solved by a computer. It doesn't matter how fast it is, or how much money you spend, or how much uh, time it takes, it's mathematically provable that you can't solve these problems. So let's assume we have a computer that takes some input, and all this computer tells you is, on that input, am I gonna halt or run forever? Alan Turing proved that it's impossible to build a computer program that can take his input, another computer program, and tell you if that program will ever halt. It can't be done. He's proven that. And I leave that all for you as a homework assignment. Please turn it in Monday on Carmen by 8 a.m. So what does that have to do with computer science? Well, first we gotta step back in our time machine. So now we roll ahead to 1940s, and the world is at war. The Germans are using something called an enigma. It looks like a typewriter, and you put a special key into it, and then you type your message. And if the recipient has that enigma and has the same key, they can read that secret message. And German mathematicians figure out it's gonna take 100 years for 100 mathematicians to break a single message, and they change the key every single day. It's unbreakable, it's secure. And now you should hear Frank's voice in the back of your head. Because French, Polish, and British um, mathematicians have figured out there's a bug in the enigma. And every once in a while, mathematicians were able to, by hand, break a single message. But that gave them hope. Maybe we can automate this. In walks Alan Turing, who's now working for British intelligence. And he says, we could automate this. And he builds the bomb, the first computer. And it's able to break the Enigma messages. And the work on the Enigma is credited for ending World War II two years early and saving 14 million lives. It's pretty good for a 29-year-old mathematician. The real irony here is that the bomb, the first computer ever built, was built to break somebody's privacy, to break their secrecy. Let's step back into our time machine. The year is 1960, and now we have computers. And computers are solving problems, but we don't, the computers can't talk to each other. There's no network, there's no concept of a network. So in comes an organization called ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency. Now we call it DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And they think, maybe we can create a common language that will allow any computer to talk to any other computer. So they do just that. And that's the handwritten sketch of what the first ARPANET is. It's four universities with four different computers that were all speaking the same language. And it was the first time these computers could talk to each other. Now the ARPANET was a research project. Everybody knew each other, everyone trusted each other, and there were no secrets. So no security was built into the ARPANET. ARPANET evolved into the NSFNet, National Science Foundation and that involved into the internet. So the internet we have today has absolutely no security built into it. It was a research project that went into production. Let's get back into our time machine. And now we have 1980s and Fred Cohen. And Fred Cohen was interested in computer viruses. He was interested in how viruses infect a live body and how a, a living person and how they would bury themselves deep in them and then set off a payload and maybe infect other living bodies. And he said to himself, maybe I could build a computer program that would do the same thing. I mean, what could go wrong? So his master's thesis had three parts. The first part was a theory that said, this is how we would build a computer virus. The second part was actual working viruses. He proved it wasn't just a theory. And the third part was a proof that said, if I can build an application that can detect all viruses, then I can solve the halting problem. And since Alan Turing showed it's impossible to solve the halting problem, proof by contradiction, it's impossible to build a computer program that can detect any antivirus. It's an impossible problem, it can't be solved. 
So the antivirus program that run, is running on your computer actually had as a database of signatures and behaviors of previously seen viruses. And every time a new virus is created, which is thousands every week, they have to push a new signature to your computer. And that's why you have to constantly update your antivirus. It's trying to solve an impossible problem. Other engineers have found that it's impossible to build a computer program that can detect all of the bugs in other computer programs. All the errors, the things that hackers use as doors to break into your computer. It's impossible to do. So as the vendor finds more bugs in your operating system or your applications, they have to push out patches. And that's why you're constantly updating your operating systems. And a whole lot of other security problems are unsolvable. For example, detecting malicious behavior on a network or doing perfect forensics after the fact. Those are all impossible problems. In fact, the entire field of computer security is trying to solve impossible problems. It's a $260 billion a year industry based on myth, metaphor, and wishful thinking. We prove that to you every single time we force you to take a class that says, don't click on the attachments or don't click on the hyperlink. You see, my field, computer security, is so good that if you do something on your computer that some engineer designed for you to be able to do, you could infect your computer, lose all of your information, and the average right now is three to six months to detect that a bad guy is in your network, and in that time, he steals all your information. Now, Bruce Schneier, who wrote the book on digital cryptography, he wrote the book on how to send secret messages, would later come out and say, if you think technology can solve your problems, you don't understand the problems, and you don't understand the technology. So in order to understand this, in order to solve our problems, we have to think differently. We have to become hackers. So the first thing is, we have to understand the limits of our technology. If you're a computer science major, or an information technology major, or a management information systems, you have to understand who Fred Cohen and Alan Turing are, and what the limits are that they impose. Not understanding who these people are is like being a physicist and not understanding who Isaac Newton is. Second, if you're a decision maker or a politician, you need to understand that I can't defend you. I can't guarantee that bad guys aren't going to do bad things in your computer. I don't care if you jump up and down and scream or you give me a $20 million bonus. Bad guys are going to get in. I prefer the $20 million bonus. So maybe it doesn't make sense to take our most sensitive information and our most sensitive systems and connect them to a Wi-Fi enabled coffee pot who God only knows what code is running on it and then connect it to the entire world where there's people who want to do mischief. Remember that this, these vulnerabilities don't just exist in your laptops or in your phones. They exist in everything. They exist in your electrical power grid. They exist in our nuclear power plants. They exist in our artificial intelligence. And they exist in your self-driving cars. So the second thing we need to do <clears throat> is we teach our, our engineers to think like scientists. Test, uh, design, build, test, repeat. But that's not always how hackers think. Like when you're driving down the street and you see two yellow lines in the middle of the road, what do you think? Danger, do not cross. I think it's paint. It's just paint. It's not stopping me from doing anything. And that's how hackers think. They're not constrained. We need to get our, our engineers to think like hackers, think differently about the problem. And how do we do that? We do that by teaching our engineers the cognitive and social sciences. They need to understand psychology. They under, need to understand deception. They need to understand uh, self-deception, things like cognitive biases that make you make the wrong decision, that make you think irrationally, even though you don't know, realize you're not doing that. They need to think out of the box. They need to learn economics, like game theory and strategy, because that's how I think. What are your actions? What are my actions? What are your counteractions? What are my counteractions? I'm going to think 12 steps ahead, so no matter what you do, I win. And we need to teach our engineers to think that way. 
And we need to teach them business. Because right now, the, the latest survey is business understanding is the biggest shortcoming in computer security people. And how do they know if that technology they're building and they want to deploy on their network is actually going to make it worse for the business? Now, I'm not talking about let's build six classes with two years of prerequisites. I'm talking about one multidisciplinary class as a general education course. No additional classes needed. The, the engineers could take this course as part of their curriculum and learn to think differently about problems. And last, we need to be informed netizens. You need to understand, I can't guarantee the identity of the person you're talking to online. I can't guarantee what they're telling you. And as the last four years have shown, that if you can't understand, uh, if, if, if you don't understand the identity of what they're telling you, you really don't uh, understand what's being told. Um, so think, consider what people are telling you and have a healthy level of skepticism when you're online. Be safe out there. Thank you.